The pardon board uh, will resume at uh, 218. Our next case is Mr. Adam Harmenter. Mr. Harmenter, would you please give us your full name and DOC number? Adam Joseph Harmenter, Jr., 105202. Mr. Armitage, let me explain our process to you. We're going to conduct a, a pardon interview with you. At the appropriate time, we'll allow those persons who wish to have input to have their say uh, here today on your behalf, uh, speaking on your behalf, is uh, your niece, Danielle Copeland, uh, your sister, Tony Broussard, your attorney, Franz Borgard. And also here, but not speaking, is uh, Jonathan Broussard, Rebecca Bell, Terry Ann Richardson, and Shirley Jensen Denise, and uh, Denise Foster. Okay. Uh, in opposition, uh, we have uh, speaking uh, Doreen Batto, the victim's sister, Lois Batto, the victim's mother, Scott Ryder, the victim's spouse, uh, not speaking. Uh, Corliss Baddo, Bonnie Baddo, Tana Ryder, and Father Kevin Baddo. Got spouse, but all right. Mr. Armitter, I'm going to read some information into the record. Uh, the, uh, this is uh, Adam J. Armenter Jr., DOC number 105202, uh, date of birth August the 1st of 1959. He's a second class offender. He is currently serving a life imprisonment on the charges of armed robbery and aggravated rape, having been sentenced on February the 23rd of 1984. Uh, Mr. Armenter, is all of that accurate? <clears throat> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is there anyone there with you? Is your attorney on Zoom? Do we know? Yes. Yeah. Oh, go on Zoom. Okay. So. All right. Your case has been assigned to Mr. Roche. Would you answer any questions he may have? Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, fellow board members, we have Adam J. Armitter Jr. here this afternoon. Mr. Armitter is seeking a recommendation for a commutation of sentence this afternoon for a 1984 conviction for one count of armed robbery and one count of aggravated rape. On July 22nd, 1983, the applicant did rob the Shell gas station at gunpoint, then forced the female attendant into the back room at gunpoint, and then proceeded to tie her hands with electrical tape, gag her, laid her on the floor of the back room and proceeded to rape her, sexually assault her, and traumatize her by committing acts against nature. When he finished the egregious acts, he left her lying on the back room floor. The next day, July 23rd, he was arrested and charged with armed robbery and aggravated rape of the victim, Ms. Shannon Bridget Bateau. Ms. Bateau was a young lady attending Lake Nice State University only in her first or second year of college. After these horrific events, she was never able to complete her college degree. After his arrest, he eventually admitted 
to committing these crimes and led law enforcement to his girlfriend's house where they recovered evidence, including the ski mask that he wore during the armed robbery and the rape of Ms. Shannon Batter. He also led law enforcement to a wooded area where he dropped some of the money and coins from the armed robbery. He was convicted as charged sometime in late 1983, early 1984. And on February 23rd, 1984, his attorney filed a motion to reconsider the verdict. The court denied the motion and Mr. Armitage was sentenced on that day to 50 years at hard labor at DOC for the armed robbery and life at hard labor at DOC for the aggravated rape. Both sentences were to run concurrently and they were to be served without benefit of probation, parole, or suspension in sentence. He had the total sentence of life. Mr. Armitage is currently 63 years old and was 23 years, 23 years old at the time of these egregious offenses. As you see, Mr. Alter was not an immature teenager when he committed this crime. He was a grown man, 23 years of age. He has been incarcerated for the last 39 years and 11 months. Mr. Alter, is all the information I just entered into the record, correct? Yes, sir, it is. So, Mr. Alma, to tell the panel exactly whether, what, excuse me, Mr. Alma, to please tell the panel exactly what happened that led up to the rape and armed robberies of Ms. Shannon Batto. Yes. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the board for giving me this opportunity. And I'd like to express firsthand and foremost um, how, how very sorry I am for those acts that I committed that day, sir. And I have to say first in uh, respect of the victim's family that's here representing her, how very, very deeply uh, grieved I am because of the acts that I committed on that day. And um, I thank him for uh, this. Um, on that day, June 22nd, 1983, at the age of 23, I robbed the Gulf gas station and raped Miss Shannon Badeau at three o'clock in the afternoon. The armed robbery of this station was motivated with my desire to get more money to buy more drugs. Recently coming back from a divorce out of California, I had not been in Lake Charles long. I was a broken, empty young man who used drugs and alcohol to cope and escape my life. Influenced through the, through the belief that dealing or not dealing with that reality was to get lost in the fog of using and needing more drugs. Mr. Mr. Armature. Yes, sir. I understand you, you were in need of funds. Yes, sir. For drugs and other things that you were addicted to. 
That could have been accomplished by robbing the Shell gas station. I need to know what was your mindset that you had to rob and then brutally rape a young lady who was in her first year of college? Yes, sir. Um, the robbery itself was um, was was an act of me going there that day to get gas for my car. Um, having going inside, it was three o'clock in the afternoon. I went inside. I saw the gas. Um, I saw the money in the register. Um, going back outside to my car, I pulled around on the side of the gas station. I went back in, inside with the pistol that I kept in the glove compartment. Um, and I robbed her. Yes, sir. Um, the rape itself, um, while, yes, sir, I do confess to this, um, as I did that for that crime. Um, to this day, something clicked inside of me. I can't say why I did that today to this day. I still don't understand why I did that, sir. But I do know this. She didn't deserve that. Um, and the, uh, the regret that I feel today because of that. And um, it just, uh, the senseless lack of this moment, um, that moment that happened, it made no sense. Um, yes, sir. I, um, I did everything in fact that you did say, sir, but that day later on, whenever the sheriff's department arrested, uh, came and picked me up, they questioned me and I was, uh, so high on drugs that I passed out while they were questioning me. And they put me in a cell the next day on, um, uh, the very next day. Um, I woke up and I asked somebody, why was I in there? And upon being told why I was there, I asked to talk to somebody about what I had did. A um, couple hours later, they came and got me out of my cell. And it was the sheriff's detectives. They brought me back across for questioning. Once they affirmed what indeed I had did, I confessed to it. Because at that point, sir, I wasn't raised like that. I wasn't raised to do this to another person, much less treat Miss Badeau as I treated her as I did. And that point, having a little bit of rationale to my, um, in my heart, I confessed to what I did, taking accountability and being responsible for it. And they brought me back to the jail. Yes, sir, they did. And they charged me with what I did. Thank, thank you for your honesty, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, opposition in this case comes from the Calcasieu Parish legal community. The whole legal community in, in uh, Washington, and Calcutchew Parish is opposed. The DA's office submitted a statement, and I quote, extremely opposed. That office goes on to say, and I quote, the victim deserves nothing less than the full set, unquote. That was a statement from the DA's office given to us only a month ago. It was our position also from the Calcasieu Sheriff's Office and the Chief of Police of Lake Charles, Louisiana is strongly opposed to any clemency in this case. The victims, <clears throat> excuse me, the victim's family is vehemently opposed against any deviation in your life sentence. The brother of the victim, 
Father Kevin L. Bato. And Father Bato is a Catholic priest, and he states he is Adamly Holmes. The victim's sister, Doreen Bato, is a Holmes. The victim's sister, Carlos Bato, is Adamly Holmes. And lastly, the mother of the victim, Mrs. Lois K. Bato, is adamantly opposed to any clemency because of the tremendous suffering and pain her daughter went through until her early death at the age of 42. Mrs. Life Bato stated in her letter, she still wonders today if the events of that day had anything to do with Shannon's early death from breast cancer. She is requesting that no deviation in the life sentence be granted. The applicant has an extensive criminal background. He has nine or 10 arrests. Two of those arrests of a violent nature. And his police record shows that he was on supervision in California, but those details were not available from the state of California. What were you arrested in California for? Mr. Armitage? Um, I only had one forgery charge in uh, Northridge, California. Right. And that was uh, and that was only for a uh, three month suspended sentence and restitution for the two checks that I had cashed. And that was my only record from California, sir. Okay. Uh how about your arrest record in Louisiana? My arrest record in Louisiana, I had no priors before this arrest. Okay. 1978, possession of illegal firearms. 1978, battery on the police officer. Resisting arrest. Failure to maintain control. In DWI. Okay. Now it, it says Adam Joseph Armature Jr., the OC of 105-202. Is that not your name and DOC number? That is, sir. And in 1978, worthless checks in Calgary Parish. 1978, Calgary Parish, a simple assault with a weapon, simple battery. 1979, criminal mischief. Were you, were you in California in 1981? In 81, yes. Sir. Los Angeles Police Department, forgery. 1983. Calcasieu Parish, armed robbery and rape. So you did have a criminal history prior to these arrests, am I correct? Um, if I may, sir, out of respect for what you just read, mm -hmm. um, the incidents, all of which you mentioned in 1978 was involved whenever I wrecked and totaled my car. Were you, yes, arrested? Were, um, you, were you arrested? Uh, yes, sir, I was. But all the ch charges which you mentioned there in 1978 was on the same evening at the same night, sir. And yes, yes I'm not denying anything that you said there, but all that which occurred was, and I, 
I guess in some point I'm trying to clear that record in. That was not a period of over a year. That was a one night incident where, yes, sir, I was drunk. I did wreck my car and totaled. It was a it was my brand new 1977 Monte Carlo. There was three others in the car with me that night. And whenever I totaled out the car, we were there waiting for um, the wrecker and the police, state police to come because it's on the house. Do you remember when this accident happened? Yes, sir. Okay, what? And that was in 1978? Yes, sir. When in 1978? Um, I would presume in the winter, um, it was, I was, it was whenever I was 19 years old. And as I stated that the, okay. the Mr. Armitage, one arrest was in March, 1978. One arrest was in August of 1978. One arrest was in October, 1978. And the other one was in November of 1978. So this couldn't have been one occurrence. You were arrested over a period of 10 months in 1978 for different offenses. Right. I was referring to where the DUI, the resistant arrest, the gun charge, and the, um, the battery charge. Um, and I want to address that, that that's what I was referring to. Okay. The others, yes, sir, it did happen. Yes, sir. And then you had another arrest in 1979 for criminal mischief. Right, yes, sir. Okay. So my point is that you did have a prior criminal history before the armed robbery and the rape. Right, yes, sir. I just want to get that clear. Yes, sure it is. Thank you. Let me get back to my report. So let's go over your most recent annual evaluation. That's on page 61. Uh, as you said before, you're 63 years old and you are housed in minimal custody. You have 11 disciplinary write ups, and we'll talk about your write ups a little bit later. You have a low risk assessment and you have a high school diploma. When did you receive your high school diploma? In 1977, sir. And where from? Um, from Lake Charles High School in Lake Charles. Right. And we'll go over your educational and vocational achievements a little later in your program. Uh, I see where you participate in the Body of Christ Fellowship, CPR, and the AA Silver Group. So tell me about the AA Silver Group. Um, AA so Sober Group is one of the um, programs of the many that I've participated in. Um, in that group, I have understood that I was powerless to manage or control anything that was wrong with me. Also learned how to acknowledge that I needed a higher power, which I've understood to be God, and uh, become to have a relationship with Jesus that have community service at Camp F, where I'm an active member of that fellowship, sir. Um, I have learned uh, to um, have living amends in my community. There's, there's no way that I can make up for what I did toward Miss Bado, her family, the, um, the robbery of the gas station. Well, what I've learned to make amends with, because that is one of the steps in AA, is that I can make a living amends with uh, not being that person that committed that, that act whenever I was only 23 years old. But now I can be an asset in my community. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Armitage. 
Uh, let's talk about your transition plan, which is sister in Fort Worth, Texas. Tell right. me about um, Right now, it's twofold. Uh, depending on if the board would extend mercy and grant me this clemency, um, the short term would be going to the parole project, which I have, in fact, been in touch with Carrie Myers there. Uh, um, as we talked over a period of time, uh, my sister and my family would prefer that I go out of state to the Fort Worth area. Um, she has information, and I believe she's going to say as such, for a reentry plan as well as a transitional phase. She's been in touch with groups um, that I can be an active part of these programs. Um, I know that I'm recovering some, from some addiction, sir, and I'm going to need that ongoing in the course of my recovery. And uh, through their support and making myself accountable to these and the programs that I'll have need of there, that I'll continue that then. Okay. Uh, your institutional record is good. Uh, all the uh, comments from the work supervisor, the security supervisor, and the classification officer are very good. Uh, as I said before, you have 11 disciplinary write-up. The last disciplinary write-up was in August of 2006. Is that correct? August of 2006. Um, I'm sorry, I've got um, um, my last write up was in 2000. Well, it, it's a bad copy. That's the August 8th, zero, and it looks like a six, but that's zero, zero. Yes, sir. It's his last report was uh, August 8th, 2000. For a rule okay. It, it looks the last of zero looks like a six on my copy. So it's been some 23 years since your last write-up. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's an excellent job. Uh, let's talk about your achievements. Uh, first of all, as you said before, the first thing you listed was your high school diploma from Lake Charles High School. You had a Diploma in Carpentry in 2003, CPR in 1993. Uh, the sex offender treatment uh, was completed in the late 90s and early 2000. I think you finished the last phase, phase four of sex offender treatment in 2002. Is that right? Yes, sir, it is. Tell me. Uh, what did you get from facilitating the sex offender treatment? Um, basically, in, in that program as a whole, I learned that I could manage uh, my emotional response. Um, a lot of it dealt with cognitive choices. You can control how you react. You don't have to just react. And um, I really appreciated that. And becoming a facilitator after that class, I really learned that I love to serve and help other offenders who, for a lack of better words, they had been in the dark with their problems, with their past. And that program gave us a place to where we could talk about that and get that out of the dark and bring it in the open, um, we can honestly look at it and understand that we don't have to make the choices that you once did. You don't have to react um, so, um, so violently, so aggressively, and uh, you can really change. And that really helped me just as much as I was helping others, sir. Yeah, what did you learn about the victim in sex offender treatment? Um, I, I don't know how to easily say this. 
I learned that she was a person. And she didn't deserve being treated how I treated her that day, sir. And I can't explain it very well. But what I did that day to her, to Miss Shannon, no person should be treated that way. The acts, the violent acts. Um, I learned in that sex offender class that the real issue wasn't about the sex, really wasn't. But the issue was about I was an angry young man out of control. And in some form of fashion that day, I took control of something that that just clicked in me. And I expressed an anger over that young woman that no person should ever have expressed or endure or have to go through that kind of pain, sir. And I know very well uh, that that there's nothing that can ever undo that. There's no better that I can go through to make up for that. That's what I called a while ago, learning how to live in amendments, because I can't amend for that, sir. I'm here asking for mercy. Um, and, and having maybe the chance to express that not only um, um, have I attempted to become a better person, but in somehow, some way that her family, because I know she's not here, but her family can have some type of closure because there's no justification. And I'm really, really sorry for what I did to her. I really am. From reading the letters from her family, they sort of detail the torment and the anguish that she went through the last 20 years of her life. I presume she was about 20 years old. She was a freshman of sophomore college. And the torment and the the anguish and pain that she went through was tremendous. And that was explained in the letters from her brothers and her sisters, and especially her mother. Uh, you've completed uh, anger management, thank you for a change, uh, victim awareness, many, many, many uh, seminars and classes and Bible studies. You have done very well uh, as far as programs are concerned, discipleship training, prison fellowship training. Uh, it, it's just a tremendous amount of um, programming that you've gone through. Tell us about your vocational training while you've been incarcerated? Um, that would have to be doing with carpenters, sir. Uh, at first, to begin with, they wouldn't let lifers into school. Um, I got in as an orderly, just cleaning up around the shop. But then they, they let us get into night school. So I got into night school first, and I completed that. They only gave us an hourly certificate. But I found out that I enjoyed working with my hands. And not only did I enjoy it, I counted good at it once I learned it. So then it was Jumaville Votech, Louisiana College. And I was able to complete a two-year associate degree and graduated from there once they allowed us to take the daytime class. And since that time, I've been involved with carpentry work. I worked here at the, uh, the casket shop for the, um, for the prison. And after that, I got involved with uh, construction at Road and Leffy. For the past 20 years, I've been working that job, sir. And, and for the record, I've read all the work evaluations from the road and maintenance. And all the work evaluations are excellent.
Mr. Uh, Mr. Alderton, do you have any mental health issues now? No, sir. Did you have any mental health issues in your history? Yes, sir, I did. Okay, so tell me about the uh, medical, I mean, the mental health evaluation that you had in October of 1983. Um, and um, I guess that's in referring with... Um, um, in California, and, and yes, sir. Um, my, I was raised by my grandfather and my grandmother, and my grandfather had passed away, sir. And I was called two hours before his funeral, and they told they told me one of my cousins had told me that where are you? How come you you're not here? And uh, whenever she told me that Papa had passed away, um, there's no way in, I could get to Lake Charles from Los Angeles in two hours. And um, I had a nervous breakdown. Uh, the doctors went on after. Uh, then my wife and her family had me uh, put underneath 72 hours evaluation. And uh, at Olive View Mental Hospital, and I was evaluated there, and um, I was having a psychotic episode. About I, like I said, it was a complete nervous breakdown. Um, there was there was mention in that evaluation of a chronic drug abuse problem. Um, excuse me. Can you repeat the question, please? There was mention in that report that it was caused by a chronic and acute right. drug abuse problem. Right. Yes, sir. Um, out there, I had got involved with um, street name of Downers, and um, there I had even then as a young man, because whenever I first moved out to California at 19, um, it was like a kid in candy store, sir. Uh, and I was an abuser of it. Um, and like I said, shared that whenever I got the news of Pawpaw's death, I couldn't handle it. And uh, I had a breakdown. Have you ever received inpatient treatment for your drug addiction? Um, as um, the actual, are you talking about like a substance abuse program, sir? Yes. No, sir, not a actual, actual um, like that, no, sir. At any time during your incarceration, have we ever received a write-up for intoxication? No, sir, I have not. So, are you a drug addict? Um, I believe I'm living a life in recovery, yes, sir. So, in, um, I guess I'm not an active user, but I know, sir, that I'm going to have to live in the balance as, as I've learned it. And uh, through one of the courses that I've taken is called a, a life of addiction as well as a life of recovery. That in this, I've learned that I will have to be accountable and I will have to have not only people that support me in this, but that actually will help me to make that transition, sir. Uh, Ms. Owens, what does a sobriety plan look like for you? Um, sobriety plan for me looks like um, first and foremost, is being active in my community with the church, being active in community with a recovery program. Um, to begin with, probably weekly in meetings, sir. Um, people that are familiar, 
people that I can share openly and honestly with um, here as well as then. I'm already involved in that and I would pray that that would continue. Thank you so much. I appreciate you asking this afternoon, Mr. Arbiter. Mr. Arbiter, I need to enter your record that you have 13 outstanding letters of support for your clemency. You have letters from your mother, your sister, your brother in law. Multiple cousins, aunts, uncles, clergy, even friends that you met at the rodeo wrote letters supporting your clemency. And you have three or four letters from your fellow offenders supporting your clemency. So you have a very good network of support. Any other programs or achievements that you would like to mention before I complete my interview? Um, no, sir, you're, you've been fairly thorough, sir. Warden Ambo, would you like to make any comments, concerns, or observations at this time? Uh, no, sir. Uh... I must go with uh, the inmate uh, officer. You've been very thorough with everything. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do have a recommendation, and I will share it with my fellow board members at the conclusion of this interview. Thank you, Mr. Rochette. <clears throat> now we'll hear from your supporters, uh, Ms. Uh, Danielle Copeland. Hi, so I'm Danielle, uh, I'm 32 years old, a little shaky, it's a little cold here. Um, and I know Adam Armitage, uh, he's my uncle, Uncle Joey, as I call it. I want to start off really quick by saying thank you for your time and consideration. Extremely thank you. I want to briefly share with you who this man is, not as what his past says or what the file in front of you says. He is, but he is my uncle and he is a great one. He is empathetic, kind, smart, generous, selfless, wise, humble, loving, smart, safe, gifted, and remorseful. As my visit yesterday with them was our main discussion yesterday. This is remorse for his action. And I'm proud to call my uncle despite his action. Well, these may not be words that come to mind when defining the man on the paper in front of you. It is the man I've known for the last 32 years of my life. I wanted to speak today because I only know him as my uncle I described above. I only know him as this person I brag about. Yes, his actions 40 years ago, 40 some years ago were tragic. And as a woman, I feel that and my heart goes out to her and her family, especially while sitting here today. But in these 40 some years, he has become the person I described. He has become the successful, rehabilitated case that I am beyond thankful. When I tell my friends and family I'm going to prison and visit my uncle, I get some looks. I've done it my whole life. But I respond with, no, he is a success story. And I don't mean success story as he just won a race, but success as he is in a prime example of what offenders can achieve when given a chance to be more than their negative actions. My uncle has utilized every resource while incarcerated to help him become the uncle I know and love today. He has used every resource and opportunity during his time served to become more and better than his crime. He has used these years more wisely, more diligently than most of us in here today at this exact moment to better himself. And I know this because of every visit, every phone call, every letter. I have had in these 32 years, which proves that. I have no doubt that in the outside world, he would continue to show his friends, family, and society the qualities of the man I've described and live on to leave a positive legacy with his name on. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Ms. Copeland. Uh, Ms. Tony Broussard. My name is Tony Broussard, I'm Adam's sister. Thank you also from all of our family for being here today, serving the state of Louisiana, serving the victims' families, serving the offenders. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, my name is Tony Broussard. My husband and I live in Fort Worth, Texas. We've been there for three years. We have a great community. I just want to, we have my letter, so I'm not going to repeat what was in there. But I did want to say, first and foremost, we are very sorry to the family and to the victims. Saying that, I'm very proud of Adam and what he's done in the time that he's been there. He's a vital part of our family. He's a prayer warrior. <laughs> he has wisdom. In times that our own kids went to college, struggled, he gave wisdom. He's a part of his community at work, church, and his camp. Guards call us, see how he's doing. They call us, see if we can come over and eat with them. He has the respect of fellow inmates and guards and people that he comes in contact with. He lives a faith-based, repentant life with empathy towards others. You've already said thank you for his record. I always thought I was the one that favored education, but I think he has way more education than I even have. The 14 state programs that would probably equal a social work degree. What my brother didn't state was, I think a lot of what led him to a sexual assault wasn't sex, but it was a lot of abuse that we survived together. And I'm here pretty much because of him, because of the sacrifices he gave in giving to my life, and he took the brunt of our life. However, I'm not the same person I was 40 years ago. In our community, I have sought out resources. I've been to meetings with Tarrant County Reentry Coalition. It's community-based, 35 organizations and agencies. They have his name. I have their phone number. Should he be granted mercy? We would have a plan with these agencies. He would sit down with them. Mental health? Yes. I have visited my counselor, Bob Broad, because this is a family affair. It's like from day one, he would have support. I talked to Bob Groff from Fort Worth, and he would, and his mother, who has worked with um, people with mental health issues. People out of prison would work with him from day one for accountability. We have great AA programs. We, it's not like it was in 1983 where programs were far and few between. My husband, Damien, is retired from Lockheed Martin after 35 years and has a successful tri-state industry remodeling and construction job. He has more work. He already has projects lined up for him that he would do. We have the resources, we have a home, we would like to put in a shop with an apartment for him to do some woodwork and sell um, Etsy places. Oh, grabbing the thing, thing else. thank you. Um, I have a small business called Adam's Apple where he makes things for me and I sell. And the idea there is to give 10% back to the victims of, and children of incarcerated. So in closing, Brian Stevenson and Just Mercy said, each of us is more than the worst thing we've done. Yeah. Thank you for your time. We praying for mercy. Thank you. And now we'll hear from uh, Mrs. Denise Foster. Thank you. None of us have ever been here before, y'all. <laughs> None of us. <laughs> so we're all a little nervous. Now, with that said, I can't imagine the trauma that my cousin put this family through. His dad, my mother's sister. I don't even begin to know 
what I do know, I did not find God in Angola. Okay. He was raised through his hell, his birth parents. My grandparents raised him and told him. He was on drugs and alcohol. That's no excuse, okay? You can't undo what he did ever, y'all, ever. So I feel for his, her family and his family. I will say this. I called the DA's office seven months back when this process first started. And I did not get the response you said you got. So that's interesting. <laughs> but can't help that. Um, he's the man now that he was before he did drugs. Okay. That I know. Every year you go to the craft fair, see him. I know you have boundaries and different things you have to consider. He's been there 40 years. He's a different man. I pray you see that. And I'm so sorry for what you did. And understand something. The trauma that he created 40 years ago. His dad had six sisters, so there was a lot of estrogen around, okay? And the crime he created was, I mean, I'm going to tell you, I didn't want to be around them. None of us did. And after 40 years, we finally found the grace we needed to begin. You know, my, my grandmother, who raised him, the last thing she said to me, I said, Oh, are you afraid to die? She and we called him Joe growing up, and she said, No, baby, but I'll worry about Joe. You know, I don't know what the answer is, but I'm asking you to think about and have some mercy. Um, and, and I can't imagine Janet's family. Uh, you have no malice at all, okay? But we just ask you to consider the whole picture of what has transpired in it for you. As we found the grace to forgive him, I hope it helps you. And I thank you for what you do. This is not easy. I know it's not. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, now we'll hear from the opposition. Uh, Ms. Doreen Bado. Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, honorable board members. My name is Doreen Baddo. I'm a sister of Shannon Baddo Ryder. Uh, our family comes before you today to plead with you to deny Mr. Armentor pardon, parole, or commutation. That violent day forever changed Shannon's life and that of our entire family. Excuse me. Shannon was violently raped at gunpoint by what I'm going to call him Mr. Armentor. He savagely bit her breast like a complete animal. She was a complete stranger to him. This was no act of, of passion, uh, no crime of passion, nor was the rape an accidental byproduct of the robbery. And it reveals much about the perpetrator's mindset and lack of control of animal impulses in addition, it was committed in broad daylight along a busy interstate. This highlights serious lack of judgment in many areas, morally, ethically, critically, and socially. A detective at that time told my mom that he had a police history as long as his arm. And now he says he doesn't know why he raped her. What would prevent him from doing it again to someone else? Shannon went from being a very social person who talked about everything to one who wouldn't talk about the attack and closed off communication. We were very close. We called ourselves twins five years apart. We shared everything, and yet a barrier went up. And I did not find out until after her death in 2006 that she never even told her best friend about the rape. It was too humiliating to her. Beth would invite Shannon to go out, but Shannon would say she was too busy. The reality was that she had no social life at that time. She went to school and she went home. 
she was afraid to go out and couldn't bring herself to even tell her best friend what happened because she was so ashamed. Shannon returned to McNeese and, but struggled with focus and depression and failed classes. She had to talk to faculty about the rape and they callously questioned her with personal attacks about her goodness as if she had invited the rape. She left McNeese completing a two-year degree instead elsewhere she always wanted to be a teacher and the rape basically never allowed that. She never became a teacher. She remained in fear of her assailant the rest of her life. She dreaded going to court, but it, she did it in order to protect herself and others. She feared his getting out of jail and seeking retribution on her and her family and especially her children. When her husband, Scott, who was her boyfriend at the time, told us about this appeal. He, he asked us whether his younger daughter knew about the rape. This was heartbreaking to us that this dad would have to wonder whether he would have to be the one to tell his daughter about her mom's rape. Fortunately, Shannon had told each of her kids. She didn't go into great detail, but she let them know enough to be a cautionary tale for them and for them to be wary if ever that he did get out of jail and to be wary of their surroundings in all occasions. And in the case of her son, she made it clear to him that he would, he would never treat a woman that way. Excuse me. Now her children have been learning more about the case. They cannot believe the attacker would ask for clemency as their mother lived with the consequences of his actions all her life, and now they are living with them. This was traumatic for our entire family. We felt the effects on our own jobs, our schoolwork, our relationships, and mental health. And now we are reliving the nightmare all over again as we have worked to prepare our response to this appeal hearing. And we have serious concerns, honestly, that we have given too much personal information about ourselves and our families and fear retribution. We are Catholic Christians. We pray that Mr. Armentor will truly come to know God. However, we do not believe such acts have no consequences, nor should incidents like this be treated as if time in jail is payment for the wrongdoing and injury perpetrated on the victim, her family, and others nor should the assailant be given opportunity to hurt others. In closing, Mr. Armentor made a choice and he must face the ongoing consequences of his actions. We have to face the consequences of his actions to our family every single day. Yes, it is a life sentence. It was a life sentence for Shannon too and for each of us. She did have hope that the legal system would keep him where he could do no harm. We are trusting the legal system as Shannon did to do the right thing for the greater good. Therefore, we respectfully plead with you to deny his request for parole, pardon, or commutation. And we sincerely thank you for allowing us to speak to you today. Thank you very much, ma'am. Now we'll hear from Ms. Uh, Lois Battle. I am Lois Battle, mother of Shannon fourth of seven children. When I learned of Shannon's assault and rape, I was stunned and immediately called out to God and wanted to go to her. When I went to the hospital and the police station, I wasn't allowed to be with her as she was being examined and questioned. We didn't really communicate until we were in my, in my car heading home. And we are not asking for revenge or retaliation. There is no way to do that. Shannon said her assailant pointed a gun at her, forcing her into a back room. She was bound and gagged, could not get free to resist the assault in any way. Threatened with a gun, she was terrified, could only pray. She knew he was going to kill her. She kept praying for help and had an out of body experience where she looked down to see him abusing her. 
And then she knew she was going to live. And when he left, she loosed the bonds and called the police. When my husband received the call from about Shannon, our children saw him sit in stunned agony waiting for details while caring for the, our younger children. Floyd, Floyd stared at the wall, unable to speak. Shannon's siblings were fearful knowing something was very wrong. I brought Shannon home hurting and pained, but she didn't want to talk about the brutality. I am her mother, but she would not even let suffer me to see her body where her breasts had been bitten and traumatized. And if there was anything more, I never saw it. She wouldn't talk about it. At home, she was comforted by her father, her brothers, and sisters. We did see her family doctor, as this was very hard on her. We were anxious until her next monthly period, lest she be pregnant. It would not have been the baby's fault. It would be a challenge. Every baby deserves to have a loving father and mother. Shame continued to shadow her all her life, beginning with the rape, her court trial, <coughs> where her goodness was questioned, to the gas station employer who fired her for allowing the robbery. To school Mr. Spano, I, I don't mean to cut you off. We have your letter and we have read your letter. Okay. Is there anything else you would like to say to us? Oh, yes, I, oh, yes. And leading up to this hearing was an agonizing ordeal. Last Monday night, I woke up and told my daughter I had been through hell that night. I had relived the entire day of the attack and the nightmare that ensued. I was unable to think of anything else. And in these 40 years, this is just one of so many nights. I beg you not to let any victim or parent go through this again. Do not allow parole, commutation, or pardon for this act. Sexual abuse of all humans must end. Consequences must be tough enough to be a deterrent. Again, we are not asking for revenge or retaliation. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Now we'll hear from Mr. Scott Ryder. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can. If you would introduce yourself and tell us what you'd like us to know. Yes, sir. My name is Scott Ryder. I was, uh, Shannon was my, my wife. Um, I'd like to thank each of y'all for you know, the moments to speak to you today via Zoom on this very, very important matter. Uh, please know that our appearance uh, via Zoom does not diminish our opposition to this request. Logistics, age, and health prevented us from attending in, per in person. Seven Seven months or so, I received a call that Shannon and our family had hoped would never come. I was, I'm very thankful that Shannon wasn't present to have to relive the horrible events that changed countless lives. I was Shannon's boyfriend at the time of the assault. And shortly after the assault, uh, I'm going to fast forward through some of this for, for time's sake because it's been repeated many times. Um, we both dropped out of, out of college and, and eventually retreated back to the safety of our parents' homes in, in separate cities. Uh, Shannon lived in, in constant fear that evil was just around the corner. After countless hours of therapy, panic attacks continued and was too numerous to count. The good days were good, but the bad days were incredibly difficult and way too many. I would make, <clears throat> I would, I made many, many calls to the Calcasieu Parish Sheriff's Department just to be able to assure Shannon that he, that he was still uh, in jail. This continued year after year. After a few years, a few years after the assault, Sharon and I did get married. We started a family and had three wonderful children. The horror continued as and seemed to escalate at times as we started having a, uh, our family. Jim was being the ultimate protector now for our children and at times caused great strain on everyone. Was it a memory? Was it a 
smell? Was it a TV commercial? Anything could trigger an incapacitating panic attack. Was he watching us? Was he around the corner? Was he behind the closed door in our own home? When our children became old enough to explain the events that had transpired, they could finally see why mom was, had such a protective nature. They realized just how amazing she was and, and she would protect her children at all costs. I can honestly say that Shannon was more scared of this monster getting out of jail and hurting one of our one of our children than she was with her stage four breast cancer di diagnosis. In her final days, knowing her mortality was near end, the dying request was that we continue to protect our children and don't let him get out. Shannon took her scars, the emotional ones, the mental ones, the physical ones, to her to the grave with her when she died. The monster should also be forced to take those, scar those same scars to his grave when he dies behind bars. Anything less would be a stab in the heart of humanity and all of the innocent victims. Let's pretend for just one second that our roles were reversed. Me and my family are members of the parole board and each of you are members of a family of an innocent victim that was brutally raped, robbed with a weapon that left lifetime of emotional and physical scars. There's one, one thing for sure that, and you could rest assured that have I, had I make, make the decision, the monster would die behind bars and it could never hurt another soul. Thank you for your time and consideration. God bless you and yours. Thank you very much, sir, for your comments. We appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Armenter, is there anything you'd like to say before we turn it over to your lawyer? Um, go ahead. Um, I would like to uh, make it clear and again say how truly sorry I am to the family of Miss Shannon. I know there's nothing that can ever be undone about this. And you're right about everything you've said about me. But somehow, some way, that young man is like another lifetime. And the man I am today, I, I wish in some way I could take that all back. I can't. And I extend. Uh, I extend that to you, and I'm so sorry she died feeling that way toward me. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Morgan, can you hear us? I can, Judge. Uh, you want to go ahead and wrap it up for us? Very, very, very briefly, guys. Um, I have sat and watched on YouTube more pardon board hearings today than I ever thought I would. Um, because of the technical issues that were happening. And one of the recurring themes I heard was this idea of retribution. What is enough? And I suppose I agree that the 23-year-old young man, the 23-year-old man, that version of Adam was in fact a monster. And the appropriate sentence for that 23-year-old man at that phase of the, his life, at that season of his life, is life. But this Adam that sits before you today is much, much different. Um, one of the things he touched on, one of the things I will emphasize, and then I will, I will wrap it up, so to speak, is that Adam is working a program for life now that he never had when he was 23. And that program requires him to work on each and every facet of his life on a daily basis. It requires him to work with other people in their lives. 12-step programs, beautiful things. And one of the things he talked about was living amends. He can do nothing. He can do nothing to give retribution to this victim. Can't do anything. Can't undo it. Can't make it right. Um, but the living amends piece is about him making it right for the rest of the world. 
and being a productive member. He's done great things at Angola. He's bettered himself. He's bettered, he's bettered his opportunities. He has a plan for when he gets out. He has not had any issues for over almost 20 years. He's been incarcerated for nearly 40, and I would ask the board to consider these things in rendering a decision. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Have a right to vote? Yes. Okay. Bring. Yeah. Obviously, oh, Roche. I'm yeah. sorry. I've been here so long, I forgot who was talking. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Arbiter, you have performed very well during your incarceration. It's been 23 years past since your last two write ups. You have tremendous good time program. You have tremendous faith based program. You've completed your sex offender treatment and facilitated that program. Um, you've just done everything possible to rehabilitate yourself. And I really think that you are rehabilitated. But there's three reasons for incarceration. The one being rehabilitation. And I think you have achieved that. The second reason is isolation. They want to isolate the bad guys from the good guys and protect the community. And I don't really think you're a danger to society any longer. And the last thing is retribution. And I think 40 years is a long time. We were 23 years old at the time you committed this offense. You're 63 years old now. But the one thing that most people leave out the equation is the victim. And a victim plays a significant part in this process. The victims are, of course, Shannon Bridget Leto, her husband, a family, especially a mother who's lived with 40 years of torment for the brutal attack on her daughter. And your family of victims. Okay. Your sister, who I discern you protect in her at an early age. But as the victim's advocate, I cannot discount, especially the mother of the victim, who is still emotionally, physically, and mentally affected by this crime. A husband who was a boyfriend at the time testified that he is still affected by this crime. I think your time is coming, but because of the victim opposition, the sisters, the former husband, and especially the mother of this victim, who is not ready to see that day, day when you are released, my vote based on overwhelming express opposition from the victim's family, especially 
the victim's mother. I'm going to deny your request. Uh, Mr. Armentier, I, I do believe that you are rehabilitated. You believe that you do not pose the risk to society. I don't in any way discount the just the terrible nature of this crime and the suffering that you imposed on this family. I don't discount that at all. For my job, my belief that the board's job is to look at the person today. Who are they today? Have they done enough to uh, improve themselves, improve the life of others, <laughs> to have the privilege to be And I think that you have done been incarcerated years serve that time well and so my vote would have been would be to grant uh, a commutation recommendation commutation to 70 years thank you mr jackson mr uh, uh yeah after listening to everything today my vote is to grant and commute the sentence to 75 years Mr. Armenter, uh, uh, unfortunately for you, this has to be a unanimous vote, and we already have one that has uh, denied your vote. I do sympathize with the victims. Crimes that we hear day after day after day are horrible. And the people who commit those crimes do horrible things. But our job, I believe, my responsibility is to look at the person who committed that crime, who they are today, and what they've done while they're there. And it's clear to me, after listening for an hour plus of all of the accomplishments that you've done and all the things you've done, uh, that you're ready. My vote, likewise, would have been to commute, recommend to the governor that your sentence be commuted. Uh, my colleagues, one said 70 and one said 75. I, I would be with either one of those. My, my vote would be to uh, commute to uh, 70 years. But, uh, unfortunately, uh, it required a unanimous vote today and you didn't get there. So good luck to you, sir. I hope you continue to do the things that you're doing uh, because uh, you're on the right track. So good luck. Thank you. So, let's unpack that. You know, it's, it's, uh, I guess we could start with the question that you might have, which is why, why does it need to be unanimous vote um, when so often it only needs to be four votes? And, and really the reason comes down to the fact that there's only four board members uh, residing at this hearing. Uh, m most of the time for commutation hearings, it it's five board members, uh, but which allows there to be a four uh, four votes to to with one objection to get it through. But in this case, um, as we're saying now, uh, no way, Roche. Uh, put a stop to it right at the very beginning and I'll just come out with it and say I completely agree with Mr. Roche and really the reason that I come down to that conclusion is because of the mother she is at an age where where it's where I would just make the simple argument that wait until she she passes on. Don't victimize her again. 
and whether and now he he can reapply every five years which means that he can victimize his poor mother every five years to have to show up to a hearing but it, it, I, it, it's just if you want to call it a compromise if you want to call it you know I don't know whatever it be but to, to say you know what just wait just wait until she she's she she's just don't victimize her mother one more time by setting this man free in her lifetime and maybe the judges would have voted differently some of them maybe miss jackson maybe you know i uh if if mr roche had not had not been the first to vote i'm not convinced that some of these judges would have wanted him to, to be set free, but it's more like sending a gesture of goodwill once they know that he's not going to get a recommendation to the governor to be, to be released. There's, there's, only, there's only one appeal, and it's very short, so we're not going to go through it, but I will include the link in the description if you want to read it. But basically, his appeal that was brought up, that I think Mr. O'Shea touched on at the beginning, was trying to basically make him, um, you know, it was the insanity defense. I guess the, the classic defense when your back is against the wall and you have nothing else to, which I think Mr. O'Shea brought up about his, or was trying to allude to, but they're trying to say that he had a tentative diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia, or one psychiatrist uh, tentatively diagnosed as multiple personality disorder. You know, they had all those psychiatrists get up and say these different things. And it's it's pretty, you know, ridiculous. It's like, okay. You know, it's, uh, and obviously we can clearly see that the psychiatrist, it's like they're put up in a defense because here he is all these years in prison without any, like, episodes at all, right? And, it, you know, the hearing starts off, which th this part, I don't know how I feel about it, or or I should say, not how I feel about it, but I was a little surprised the board let him get off of it, because if you, if you recall at the beginning of the hearing, Mr. O'Shea has access to all of his records, and he asks him about some of his previous records and he comes up and states this was it this was my only you know felony this is all i've ever done i i i didn't really have anything wrong so well what about in los angeles oh well that was that was for a couple of checks oh okay well what about the incident and he's, oh well that was just a one-day thing it was my brand new monte carlo was it and i had just totaled it and they gave me all of those felonies in one shot and then mr you know but i i didn't have a year of crime and Mr. O'Shea starts listing out, I think, four different um, arrests that he had gotten in that one year. And then he says, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I did. So it's like, was were you blatantly lying to the board at your commutation hearing? Or did you really forget? And I don't know. I mean, to me, it, if you're blatantly lying, it, it just wipes out. everything you've done because it takes away the sincerity aspect. It takes away the authenticity of what you've accomplished in my opinion. And I, and I know that. So I guess the board just assumed that he forgot. I mean, it was 39 years ago or more because, you know, 39 years ago is when he got locked up in 1984, maybe 40 years ago, people just forget about those things. It's just a blip in his life. Um, by the way, if you hear background noise, it's actually because I am in a truck stop. I am uh, traveling right now and I pulled off in a truck stop to do this. <laughs> So if you hear generators and things, 
loud noises. I apologize, uh, but I thought I would get uh, I would get a hearing in before I started my drive again. You know, another thing, it's like, what did he learn? What did he learn in prison? And he says, what did you learn from? And he's like, I learned that she was a person. That was, you know, you learned that she was a person. So you, you really needed to learn that? You know, and here's someone who, what was he, 24 years old or 23 years old when, when this happened? when he committed these crimes and he was married, he got divorced, then he had a girlfriend. He did this while he had a girlfriend. He, right, they arrested him at his girlfriend's house. Well, that's where they found this stuff. In broad daylight, he goes in there and he does this. He hog ties her and he brutally assaults her. As, as she, as they said, he savagely bit her breast like a wild animal. And he wasn't able to identify why he did it. He wasn't able to say there was some type of anger. He went, it was just, he simply just said he didn't know. He was blitzed out when uh, when the next day he didn't remember a thing. But like like they said, when you know to have all of that rage, that hatred, that complete disregard, it it it's a, you know it's scary. But and then they say, well, look at his record and look what he's accomplished and look how he hasn't gotten into trouble and that should show that he does have self control and. You know, you might just argue, well, there there aren't little little girls in prison. There aren't nineteen year old, you know, defenseless women in in prison. But he, 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 my heart goes to the family. You hear it. It's it's you know he he didn't take a he didn't take her life in the sense of taking her life, but he completely changed her life. And it was heartbreaking to hear how the school, when interviewing her, how they accused her, which was so typical. It's at, especially at the time, and even it's just so typical. And she never got over it. She wasn't able to 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 become a teacher. She wasn't able to to do the things that she's wanted to do and you hear the pain and then and and then she passed away at a young age which which uh, some people might argue that was only because of what happened I mean she had look at her family she has great genes They're all still around. I, I, I am, I am, uh, I am so grateful for Mr. Roche. No way, Roche, for being the victim's advocate and, and and making sure that they did not because it it would have been, it would have been. I think a complete travesty to have done that to her to her mother. It would have been victimizing her. It would have been just the wrong thing. And it, it, in my opinion, if this man has true remorse, he he will wait to find out when his mother, when her mother, passes away before filing for another commutation hearing. Because it would kill her. It would victimize her all over again. That's just my opinion.
But with that, I'll let you go.